This Week in Startups is brought to you by Gainsight. The Gainsight Customer Cloud is the only way to align your tech stack so your customer is at the center of every business decision. Turn your customers into your biggest growth engine by visiting gainsight.com slash twist today. LinkedIn, a business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit toward your first job post. And Dashlane, the leading password manager that safely stores and autofills all of your passwords, logins, payment information, and more streamlining your web browsing experience while keeping your digital identity secure. Head to dashlane.com slash twist to get 10% off of a premium subscription. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due October 14th. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. This is the program hosted by me, Jason Calacanis, an angel investor, early stage investor here in Silicon Valley. My company invests in about, we'll do 80 investments this year and probably 60 unique names. That's about an investment every three or four days. It's pretty pretty big pace. And if you want to be part of that excitement, go to gettheseat.com. What is gettheseat.com? It's just a landing page with a type form where you fill out why you should become an associate or a principal or a managing director here at our firm. Work alongside us as we put in our 50, 60 solid 60 hours a week, busting our asses to try to find great companies to fund. It's the hardest uh, job in the world. I'm lying. It's the easiest job in the world. Being an investor is the easiest and most delightful job in the world. You hang out with great founders who want to change history, and then they tell you their plans to change the world, and you put a little bit of money in, and most of the time you get nothing back. And then sometimes you get back 100, 1,000, 5,000 X what you put in. And you get to hang out with the smartest people in the world who want to change the world with their unique visions. It literally is the joy of my life to be an investor. If you want to work with me and learn how to do it, you can take 10 years out of your career path. All you have to do is work as hard as I do, which is basically like 60 hours a week. If you're willing to work hard and you're smart and clever, go ahead and go to gettheseat.com. All right, enough housekeeping. Today on the program... Josh Luber, who is the co-founder of StockX. It turns out sneakers are a thing. I just got my first pair of Yeezys. I'm the last guy to uh, get, in, get in on the sneaker game. I'm not a sneakerhead in any way, but I did watch Entourage where Turtle was buying sneakers and lining up for them. It turns out, Josh, that you've raised $100 million, $110 million in your Series C. You've now got a unicorn company in StockX. And my understanding is you sell sneakers. That's that we actually don't sell sneakers. You don't sell sneakers. No, we're, we're, we're a marketplace. We don't sell anything, right? We don't sell anything. We just connect buyers and sellers, and our sellers sell a lot of sneakers. What, when did, I just want to just pause for a second. When did sneakers become such a thing? Because I remember growing up in the 80s and 90s, like getting Jordans. Every two years, they come out with a new pair of Jordans. I think there were a, I think they were $125 at the time, which we were buying $30 sneakers. Yeah, yeah. So it was a big deal to get a pair of Jordans. It was. But it, at some point, this thing flipped over, and I was like looking on the social media, and people were lining up yeah. for days in advance. And then I'm watching the show Entourage, and he's buying the shoes and flipping them. And DJ Khaled has got a room where you played yourself, and there's like 80 pairs of sneakers to the roof. What the hell happened in sneakers? Yeah, so certainly 1985, the first Air Jordans. I mean, that is the the beginning of the whole thing. Right? It is okay. It is, but you know, even today, the whole thing. I mean, this is just supply and demand. I mean, this is econ 101 at its most basic, at its most pure. And Nike and the other sneaker brands, and particularly Jordan, are really good at playing the supply and demand game to put out less supply than there is demand for their shoes. Got and they're they're great at creating demand around whether it's it's Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Kanye West, and there's demand associated with different colors or different materials. And then the brands are just really good at figuring out how do we put out just not quite enough? And uh -huh. if, if that happens, if you have more demand than there is supply, well, that leads to people sleeping outside of sneaker stores. It leads to sellouts that happen immediately. And it leads to just a difference in, in value, right? Mm -hmm. it, therefore, that person can go and, and sell it to somebody else for more than what that retail price is. And as soon as you hit that tipping point, as soon as you're buying something, it's a pair of shoes and it costs 150 bucks, but it's worth 
$200? It's worth $500? It's worth $1,000? Well, who wouldn't buy a widget for 150 that you can sell for 200 so And then, that, that's the start of the whole thing. When did that aftermarket start? Because I never remember as a kid anybody lining up to get Jordans. You go to the store, there were plenty of Jordans. Yeah. You just couldn't afford them. That's or right. you had to get over the psychological barrier of... Am I willing to break a hundred dollars for a pair was, of sneakers? It was crazy. Uh, that, and what like, were the original Jordans at? Yeah, well, the the first they, ones were in '85. They were less than a hundred, but it was um, it was uh, 1991. The Jordan Fives that uh, was the the first time that they broke a hundred, and it was like 125 for wow. their Jordan Fives. I remember and that was that. that was I remember that too. And that's that's how a lot of us, you know, I'm 41. I have literally the exact same story as every other 41 year old sneakerhead, which is I grew up playing basketball when Jordan played. Right. I always wanted Air Jordans. My mom would never buy me Air Jordans. As soon as I got some money, I bought it. Like we all have the exact same story. And which Air is Jordans really were a funny. bit of a liability growing up in Brooklyn because if you were wearing them, you could get jumped for them. Well, that that actually is is core to this whole thing. So you asked about how it like exploded. For the longest time, it was this very like underground local thing. Well, first of all, we didn't have the internet, mm -hmm. so the, this was happening at a very local you know uh, thing. But what happened was essentially there's two major jumps in this market. One is just 99, 2000, internet, eBay, for yeah. all the reasons, right? And then the second one was really 2011, 2012, Instagram, social media. Ah. And now you have all these other people that are coming into the market. The whole time the brands have been playing this game, led by Nike and Jordan. Mm. But as more and more people have access and more and more people have in that information of products that they might want, and now they have a place to be able to get them. Sure. Right? It, it, I don't have to explain. So here no we e go up on the screen at StockX. Oh, that's is a good one. the Air Jordan uh, AJ5 TR Retro Trophy Room Ice Blue. Killing it with the ice blue. These are highest bid $1,565 on your website. Lowest ask $1,800. Yep. Uh, these are for nine and a half my size. So what what's going on here? So is for, this like eBay or is this an auction or is it a stock market? What's going on here? Well, so it, so StockX is an actual stock market in, okay. in every way. And look, when I say a stock market, immediately people think about investments. But it's not about investments. It's about the method of how we connect buyers and sellers. Okay. Right? All a stock market is is a giant place where people want to sell stock, want to, people want to bids buy and stock. Asks. They come together yeah. around bids and asks. Yeah. You haven't been asked. You can have a true market price. By the way, as a starting point, you notice there's one page for this particular shoe, right? You go to mm -hmm. eBay, there's a thousand listings. Right. Right. So you have a difference between a listing model and a product page model. Got it. Right. In the same way that there's one ticker symbol for Nike Because these are a commodity. Stuff. Exactly. They're, these are all brand new. Yep. These are all verified to be real, mm -hmm. legit. The retail price is two hundred. These came out. Well, mm -hmm. wait. These were released in twenty nineteen. Yeah, this is May of this past year. So this is a May retro. Okay. Well, so the the Jordan Five model first came out in 1990, 1991, and they've re released many, many, many colors of this particular uh -huh. model, and so that's why it's called a, a retro. And so this colorway though has never been released before. And what's really interesting about this particular one, it's called the Jordan Five Trophy Room Ice Blue. Trophy Room is the sneaker store owned and run by Marcus Jordan, Michael Jordan's son, oh. in Orlando, Florida. And so they created this particular shoe, which was very limited. And by the way, there was a, a blue and a red pair. The red pair sells for about 5X this. And um, and it's just pure supply and demand. There were not a lot of them made. It was a very special thing just made for, for Marcus's Is store. Is anybody able to yeah. buy these at cost? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, okay. Sure, you could get super lucky and you could win a raffle, right? But okay. you know the the number of people participating in that raffle is so high, the chances of winning are effectively zero. You could some in some places you can sleep outside of a sneaker store for three days, mm -hmm. right? For, not a lot still do first come first serve, Got it. but some do. And if you want to wait in line for three days, you can do that. Ah. The other way is, um, you know, is that Nike will have essentially an an online raffle, Got right? It. Where so you where put Nike in, a bit in order. Yeah. And and but the the thing is is this particular one, right? I mean, the red one's selling for six thousand dollars, so everybody wants it. And so what happens is the chance of winning that raffle is effectively zero. If I wore these, because I can buy this, listen, it's I'm not going to. It's mm -hmm. six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But I could afford that. I could buy that. Yep. If I wore these courtside yep. for the finals game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's courtside finals, uh, as one does. Would anybody notice would like Oh yeah. Would Kawhi Leonard come up to me like, be like, yo, Jake out, what's up? And he would know? 
I don't know. With I don't these? know. I don't know if Kawhi would have noticed. But Kawhi's uh, a bit of he's corny, yeah. right? He's kind of a square, right? Uh, he went and, and signed nerdy. with New Balance. Talk about like the biggest thing. He had a he had his own uh, he had his own shoe with Jordan Brand. They made and him. He went to they, New they, Balance. They, they called it. A, they called it the Claw. And they the the um and then he literally went and signed with New Balance. I mean, he did a lot of crazy things in the last two years, right? But it's worked out pretty well for him. New Balance has never had a shoe classic. resell. Oh yeah, New Balance has never had a shoe resell like this ever. Whoa, and, whoa, whoa. Uh, what's going on? Those look terrible. Wait, what's New Balance? It's just you know you're looking at Jordan is, versus New that Balance. That is as corny yeah. as and this isn't even the basketball. A one. Kawhi press yeah. conference. That yeah. is as weird as a Kawhi press. This is weird as a Kawhi laugh. Uh, 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 <laughs> That's not bad. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> what it do, baby? <laughs> what it do, baby? Yeah, you already know. What's going on with these uh, sneakers? Uh. These look like something your grandpa would wear to walk in the mall in Florida, and then he put his comb in the side with that blue yeah, highlight. Look at the one all the way on the, on the left there. There's one that's 300, right? So like, this is, I think, the one that maybe he Wait, was wearing. Wait, Kawhi is the champion? And, oh no, he getting twelve hundred right. for this. Like this one. is That's, a this is an ugly this... shoe. Like this is just objectively ugly, and um, you know, but just there was so much demand around Kawhi. But look at that. There's last sale it was ten ninety nine. There's a big know? swing there. The highest well, bid right. is two thirty five. Right. So there's yeah. not demand. No, not anymore. Right, not for this one. But if you, I mean, look at you know, if you just like click the size button, you can see all the asks real quick. Right. Ah. And so, yeah, there's just there's just not a lot of supply of what's Got going it. on here. And so the people that have them are saying, you know what? The supply is so small. We're just going to sit on it at fourteen hundred or twelve hundred. But, yeah, there's a lot of variability because it's just not a highly desirable shoe. It's just the supply is so limited. All right. When we get back from this quick break, I want to know what is the highest amount ever paid or listed for a shoe on this site. And I also want to know how. You got Eminem, Mark Wahlberg, my boy Steve Aoki, shout out Steve Aoki, uh, Scooter Braun, and all these famous people to invest in your company, as well as Google Ventures, Jonathan Trees, my boy, shout out Detroit, New Right. Uh, we get back on this week in startups. The world's changed. There used to be just a handful of vendors, but now with new technologies, vendors are developing and delivering products fast. We call it product velocity in the business, and there's much more competition, so you gotta be on your game. To win, you need to put your customers at the center of everything you do. And the Gainsight Customer Cloud can help you do that. Gainsight PX helps you understand how users interact with your product. And here is my CMO, Presh, doing it, looking at our active users, looking at the sessions, uh, and he applies a bunch of filters to look at the activity and growth and which of these users are active. And he uses this product feature to tag and track the different product elements to figure out what features they're using and maybe where they stall and when they stop using the product, as well as, of course, where they're spending most of their time. Gainsight has a suite of products, obviously, and Gainsight CDP is where they capture and segment customer data. This is to drive tailored engagement. And then there's Gainsight CS, which is your customer success manager's uh, tool where they can get all that aggregated data and optimize customer support. There's Gainsight RO, which is renewal and expansion. Uh, it's That's a critical part of all of these SaaS products. You need to get renewals and you need to land and expand. We all know that. And there's Gainsight CX which is the feedback platform that generates deeper insights about your customers so you can improve their happiness. So here is your call to action. The Gainsight Customer Cloud is the only solution that provides everything you need to turn customers into your biggest growth engine. So discover how your company can benefit from the Gainsight Customer Cloud by using gainsight.com slash twist today. G-A-I-N-S-I-G-H-T dot com slash twist. Gainsight.com slash twist. Go there now and check it out. And thank you to the team at Gainsight for supporting independent media like This Week in Startup. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, I'm getting an education in sneakers. Josh Boober is here. You're a sneakerhead. Is that what they call you guys? Yeah, I've collected sneakers probably since That's, I was eight years old, 10 years old. What's the most you spent on a pair of sneakers? Me personally? Personally. Me personally, the most I ever spent is only about 900, 950. 950. Okay. And but well, but well, it was a shoe. It was the 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 first Air Presto off white. So Virgil Abloh was the designer from Off White and very sort of big in sneaker and streetwear world. Is um uh, created these shoes and so not this one. This is the white one. So if you go back, there's actually three different ones. There's one that's black and white. Air Presto. Yeah. Off whites. 
So if you go to the Presto and then go to the third one down. Yep. So this one was the first the first of these three released. And click on like a 10 and a half, which I'm a, or click on 11 because it's only full sizes. So, oh my Lord, 2200. Yeah. So this shoe came out. It was 250 or something like that. I wasn't able to get them at retail and it was immediately selling for seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. And there was just no way this thing wasn't going to keep going up. And, um, and so it was, it was 160. Do you wear them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I paid nine, I think 950, something like that, which is the most I've ever paid by what? far. But like I knew this was going to happen. And I knew if I ever wanted them, I needed to buy them now because now they're 2200 This is a dumb question. Yeah. But man, you buy a $900 pair of sneakers and you drop like an hors d'oeuvre on them. <laughs> Yeah. What happens? Yeah. You, then you know you have you have a, a ketchup shoe, I guess. You, I mean, you can clean shoes. It's just their shoes. You got to wear them. You got to like, wear, wear, wear them. I'll tell you what is you know bring up the the Air Jordan uh, for Carhartt, right? Okay. Which is this is the the shoe. This is a collaboration between Air Jordan and Eminem. Okay. So this Wait, Carhartt shoe, isn't that the people who make work clothes? Exactly. So and they're a Detroit brand and and yeah, M has yeah. supported Carhartt for a long time. And so. You know, these shoes. I like Carhartt stuff, yeah. So this was a collaboration with Carhartt, Eminem, and Air Jordan. It came out a little before StockX launch. So it came oh my out, lord. $20,000? Yeah. So these sold for an average of $23,000 $23, a piece when it first came out. Well, who gets that money? So they there were 10 pairs that were sold. All the money went to M's charity. Oh, okay. Okay, and they sold it on eBay. This is before StockX had launched. Okay. After we launched... Paul and M gave me a pair. So I own a pair of these. I did not pay $20,000. It was a gift, but I've worn these and I mainly wear these on stage because it's a great prop to be able to talk about that you're wearing a $20,000 shoe. But this is a great example of, you know, and by the way, a $20,000 shoe wears just like a $200 shoe. Like it's, it's still a $200 shoe, right? It's the only reason it sells for $20,000. It's just supply and demand. Like that's it. The product itself is the same. It's not made with diamonds. It's not made with gold. What I, what I would like to know is, so this is the most expensive ever? No. So the most expensive that we've actually sold, we were looking at it earlier, the Nike Mag, the auto lacing shoe from Wait, Back to the, the Future. Wait, this is the one from Back to the Future? Yeah. That exists in the world? Yeah, yeah. So we sold a pair for $40,000. Um, there was, uh, I think, one that was sold at auction for as much as $100,000. Um, but we and sold And was it one... legitimately self-lace? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you put your foot in it and then, you know, it, it just around it. I mean, obviously, it was a marketing thing. There were yep. only 87 made. Um, between Nike and, and Universal, I think they did it together. But when Nike sold it, they did it as a charity raffle. Got so it. you had to buy a $5 raffle ticket in order, and they raised a lot of money for, for Michael J. Fox's uh, okay, Parkinson's Okay, putting Foundation. aside, wow, 75 dime skis. Woo. Putting aside the auctions and charity, what's like a sneaker that regularly gets $5,000 that people buy? Is, yeah. Does that exist? Sure. So, you know, the, the off-white Presto that we looked at right there is super popular. But take a look at, like, the the um, Air Jordan 1 off-white, right? Air and, Jordan 1 right? off-white. And look at the, the, off -white the, the black, is the the black person... and red one there. So this was the first. Off-white's the designer you said before? Yeah, yeah. This is Virgil Abloh. So here's a great example. We sell a ton of these. This was the first Air Jordan designed by Virgil. It's. Um, I have to say it's kind of lit. I like that actual design. It's, it's got a lot of it's got a lot to it, right? If yeah. you if you do the 360 here and we look around it, but this is a shoe that's selling for for 4 or 5 grand and and you know, we probably sell a couple of these a day. Oh, it, I'm sorry, a day? Yeah, yeah. What is your vig? Yeah, what yeah. do you get paid on all this? 5%, 10%? Uh, uh our a little cut? starts at at 9.5% and power sellers have a little bit lower, but 9.5%, so. So every time somebody buys a $5,000 sneaker, you're getting 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. You sell a couple of those a day. It's pretty good business. So Dan Gilbert from Cleveland Cavaliers mm -hmm. is your partner in this, or yep. you've co-founded it with you? Yep. How'd you meet him? Were you from Detroit? No, I'd never been to Detroit. I'd never yeah. been to Cleveland. I never met Dan. The The short version of a really long story is that Dan and I had the exact same idea independently, which was to create a stock market for sneakers. Huh. And you know, Dan's got no ties to sneakers whatsoever. I mean, it's been four years and I literally can't get him to wear sneakers. At least huh. you got your first pair of Yeezys. Yeah. But you know, Dan had had this idea really coming from the marketplace side of, of saying, hey, why can't we buy and sell consumer goods the same way that the stock market works? And then he was exposed to sneakers through his 15-year-old son at the time, mm -hmm. who was buying and selling sneakers on eBay. This is like 2015. 
He says, you know, that's a pretty crappy market leader, and that'd be a perfect place to start a stock market. So Dan went out, unbeknownst to me, and put together a team to start working on a sneaker stock market. And those guys got like a week, two weeks into it and realized, well, like, crap, we need a sneaker guy. Right? Who's a sneaker guy? So they went out and they found this company that I was running. I was running the essentially the equivalent of the Kelly Blue Book for sneakers. It was a wow. price guide for sneakers. The company was called Campless. That's See, a smart idea. It was it was literally just taking you know the way that, that Beckett and baseball card price guides used to work, and we were scraping eBay data to build a price guide for sneakers. And so we were able to come together. I eventually sold Campless to Dan, and we became partners in turning that as the data layer into StockX as Got the marketplace. It. And then you get all of the you started collecting the M and M's of the world, Mark yeah. Wahlberg's. How did that happen? How did that go down? Well, you know, I mean, you're an investor, and so you know the the different dynamics that happens when you have a billionaire as a co-founder. Right. So, you know, in the beginning, you don't need to be out there and, and raising money. But what happened was these these relationships came super organically. And a lot of it is you know, some of it was Dan, some of it's the NBA, some of it's Detroit. Um, but literally the first one that happened was we were in a room and it randomly came up that Mark Wahlberg wears Jordans. Hmm. And Dan's like, oh, I know Mark. And like an hour later, I'm on an email chain with Dan and Mark. Two days later, I'm at Mark's house in California going through a sneaker closet, like valuing a sneaker closet. And so the greatest value we can well, give- Well, I mean, without giving up too much. Uh, it, his, his closet was worth about 100 grand. What, what? Um, right? <laughs> Which is like, it's actually, think about it. Like he had, he had a pair of the Carhartt, so that alone is 20 grand, right? Wow. So, but, and, so, be, and so Mark was, uh, was helping us. Um, Paul and M, just Detroit, there was, a, there was a lot of mutual acquaintances. Detroit's a small place. Dan is a yep. pretty prominent figure in Detroit. Yep. And so these guys were helping us anyway. And so the greatest value we could give was to create a round to let them invest. And so really started around Paul and Mark. And then we sort of asked some other people, some of Dan's relationships, uh, Ted Leonsa, Steve Case. Um, yep. uh, and then um, and then we had the opportunity to just, you know, meet some of these people. Scooter Braun, I went to college with, um, you know, Don C is a, is a guy in the in the sneaker world. So a lot, it, it became super organic and, and put together this first round, all like, you know, big names, small checks for the exact reason that, that you you would know why. So when you when you have that level of celebrity involved in your startup, is there an expectation that they'll blow you up on social once in a while, or is that like foreboding to ask them, or do you got to pay them again? Well, How does that go down? So I'm curious. So How in do this, you manage that? Well, what happened was Dan MBA sneakers open up the conversation. Got it. But it was when we're talking about the bigger idea, this idea of genuinely crank, creating a new form of commerce, of, right. of cr using stock market mechanics to, to create a, a new marketplace. And that's really what the people that got it and got the bigger idea, they wanted to be involved. And so everybody put in cash. There was no equity for services. This was purely just like write yeah. a check if you want to be a part of it. And because of that, it was a very sort of just organic relationship. Like there was no ask. Some people would help however they could. Yeah. But it, it, was a, it was a very super just all of them were yeah. organic. Cash for shares. A and it was people that that wanted to be involved, right? It was like, if I had to go sell somebody and try to convince them, then that wasn't the right person for that time, right? It, it was it was that. Um, and so then you went and got all of the Google Ventures and like legit investors in Silicon yep. Valley. How did you convince them? How was it different? Because when you have the M&Ms and the Mark Wahlbergs, if they got $100,000 in sneakers or they're in the game, yep. they're deep in the game, you don't have to explain it to them. Yep. When you start talking to Silicon Valley people, what was your approach? Were, did you find there were sneakerheads in these venture firms or did you have to explain to them like you're explaining to me this madness that I look at and I'm like, well, I, I wear Crockett and Jones, uh, yeah. which is the oldest shoemaker in the world. I pay eight, 900 bucks for these shoes that James Bond wears and every prince in England has worn, and these are the greatest shoes in the world. They're eight hundred dollars, and you're buying off whites mm -hmm. for three thousand. I gotta yeah. tell you something. Like I think my Crockett and Jones are gonna hold up. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know, but you're not gonna get much much street cred on Instagram. No, on that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. On Insta, they're gonna be like mm -hmm. Crockett and Jones is a two hundred year old mm -hmm. maker. Uh -huh. Pull up my Crockett and Jones James Bonds when you get a chance. <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead to add here. You can look up Crockett and Jones James Bond edition anyway, because mm -hmm. that's a, that we call that a collab in the Crockett and Jones shoe business. Okay. You know, it's a collab between Daniel Craig. Well, look, at, my who knows, maybe icon. maybe the next you know virtual Abloh Air Jordan is going to be a Crockett and Jones. You know, I think a Crockett and Jones mm -hmm. off white could yeah. be legit. Uh, yeah, is yeah. off white played now? Th this is I, I, this is a controversial subject. I didn't mean to bring it up so no, early, but it, I just got you know there's the studio. We got some people in the studio watching, and they got some of the Patreons in there. And somebody just said, like, I think off-whites are played. 
it's a tough. Um, I mean, it's a, it's you can a, only it's, say what you're comfortable saying, no, no, I, Josh. I, I, I know have, it's sensitive. I have I have no no uh, sensitivities or, or restrictions. It's um it's a it's a big generalization, right? Okay. Um, Off white is the brand, the, the standalone uh, brand. It hits a very specific demographic. Okay. The shoes and the collaborations that he's done with Nike and Jordan are just massive, and like they're there's there's no stopping them right now. They're but, transcendent. But, but yeah, but as as the the the, the standalone um, uh, fashion brand, mm. it's it's just a it's a it's a small demographic, right? Got it on. is not it is not necessarily the the everyday person. I mean, first of all, you have you know a hoodie that'll cost twelve hundred dollars, mm. right? Yeah, it's not the most accessible product. All right, let me take let me take you to the legit. Okay, here's the Norwich. It's black calf. This is the mainline edition. Uh, you notice the rubber sole, um, which is something very unique for them. Uh, you see the detail work here. Um, and uh, the rubber sole is right outside of the leather there, the calf leather. Mm -hmm. So that if you scuff it, you know, you hit something on the subway, you're walking down the street, the rubber hits it. And uh, it is, of course, the Deontay rubber sole. And uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> they're good enough for James <laughs> Bond. So they're good enough for you. Anyway, that's what I wear, Crockett and Jones. Go up there and all take a look at these stuff for sure. Right, well, just, we'll just... What does Spectre wear? Yeah, I don't know what Spectre wears. <laughs> yeah. I think Spectre wears wearing the off whites, actually. Uh -huh. I think that's the thing, is the villain's wearing the off whites, which right. might explain it, but these are so buttery. Do they, do they have like knives in the in the toe that you can like kick Randor, people? Just continued. Yeah. You can't get this. See, if yeah, you had yeah. the Randors from Crockett and Jones on StockX, yeah, well, that, what's that, the bid and ask on that? Yeah, that Think might be it. the only place that you can get it. Like this is this is it's funny. Like we joke, but like this is literally what happens because yeah. at the highest level, StockX, it's just about access, mm -hmm. right? It's just about being able to to be able to access products that you either yeah. don't they don't make anymore. You don't know where to get. You don't know fair prices. You don't know what the what, uh, what's real. Also with these like, Crockett and Jones, about access. you may not realize this, but if you uh, um, if you flick your foot a certain way, Q set them up so a Chinese star comes flying oh, and yeah. hit your Spectre guy right yeah, in yeah, the carotid yeah. artery. So that, they, they do have dual function there. Well, that, that, <laughs> I, I better I better be careful what I say here. If be I, careful. I, like, <laughs> what angle so, you can like kick a Chinese star at me? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of them mm -hmm. has a laser and the other mm -hmm. one as well. Really, uh, the only thing I see by your foot is a, is a kind bar wrapper. So that's yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. that's the detritus <laughs> of. If you go up and down the tenderloin here, you'll find kind wrappers and. Heroin needles. It's really. It's that's the state Dude, of Silicon it's a great, Valley. It's a great uh, combination. It's a pretty mm -hmm. great. Where's your company base? Detroit, Michigan. In Detroit. Yeah, I, I. So I moved to Detroit to work with Dan and uh, and and start StockX and big art scene in Detroit. Is there not? Yeah, yeah. There's, I heard a um, lot of artists are moving there and buying these giant mansions that you can buy if you're willing to pay the taxes on the house. Is that true? Well. It, it's less true than it was, but oh, over okay. the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of people coming in and buying a lot of property, including Dan, right? Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, Dan- He bought downtown. Yeah, basically. That's right? And, right. And, and and has activated, and it's really just a, a fascinating place to be. I mean, I, I'd never been there before, and I moved there in 2015. Even in the last four years, it's night and day. Every you know, new building, new restaurant, new activation, new art. There's a 17-foot cause statue in front of our building. Like, it's a, it's a pretty cool place. Neat. All right, when we get back, I want to hear how- the Google Ventures meeting and getting sure. these kind of big investors into the company went. Obviously, pretty easy to get people who are buying sneakers or ready and deep in the game. But how do you get these like industry titans involved in something they don't they, they likely know nothing about when we get back on this week's survey? Hiring is not as easy as just putting an ad on some message board somewhere and hoping for the best. No, that's not how you do it. That's not how you do it right in 2019. No, you want to use LinkedIn. If you're growing your business, you need to reach the right candidates at the right time. And 600 million members visit LinkedIn to make those connections and learn and grow as professionals. You know that. They also go there. Sometimes they want to discover new job opportunities. In fact, a new hire is made every eight seconds on LinkedIn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Somebody just got hired on LinkedIn. That's right. And here is my CMO, Presh, who we just upgraded to an associate. He's in the game. And here he is posting a job for us, a customer success person, manager in Toronto. Here's the job function, a little business development, a little customer service. He takes our uh, nice little job description, pops it in there. Look at that WYSIWYG editor. It looks great. Does a preview of the job and he's ready to go. But that's not all he's going to do here. He's going to pick that he wants them to have customer service experience for two years. And he's going to post that job, and it's going to show that job to the right people at the right time. He did that in seconds, and here's the good news. 
I'm going to give you $50 right now. A 50, a 50 from your boy J Cal. Go to linkedin.com slash twist, linkedin.com slash twist, and get that 50 right now. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because it's 50 bucks. So go ahead and get it, linkedin.com slash twist. And thank you to LinkedIn for supporting the show. I do appreciate it. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, senior management consultant from IBM. Josh Luber is with us. It's not the title that's often put in front of my name, but okay. It's, it's, so it, it is true. You, well, you, do, you were at IBM. Yeah, yeah. I'm a startup guy, and I shut down my last startup in the crash of 08 oh, and And I needed so a brutal. job. And you know, if a classmate of mine from business school said, hey, I heard you shut down your company. You should come work with me at IBM. And I was like, Psh. I was like, I don't think you get it. I was like, my company has four people. IBM has four hundred thousand. Like, I'm good. Yeah. And he's like, no, no. And and you know, one conversation leads to a next. Job, bad job market. And Did you so, learn something there? Oh, what did you learn? Yeah, at IBM. Yeah. By the way, none of this would have happened without IBM. I I go to IBM. I'm a strategy consultant um, in their internal strategy group. What does that mean? And it's it's Bain McKinsey type strategy work, right? It's the same thing as if you were. You what, know, what does at, it mean for people who have no idea what you're talking about? This is. I mean, at the most basic level, right? This is solving business problems. You go in there and and you know you're 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 doing work to create strategy for executives at at big companies in terms so of some big yeah. company. I don't know a non tech company, mm-hmm. most likely needs to solve a problem. Yep. What's an example of a problem? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the, the very first thing that I worked on at IBM, which is what led to this. So we were in their internal strategy. So our client was IBM, right? Mm. So we would work on IBM projects. And the very first project I ever worked on was a project for IBM's consulting organization, right? So they're, huh. they're consult. So meta. Right, yeah. And the question was, right, was about how do you staff the right number of people Consulting projects come together. You have four or five people come together. They handle a project, and then they disperse and they go off and they do their own. And so you've different people with different skill sets, but you have to have enough people so you can sell work and fulfill that project at the same time. But if you have too many people sitting around, that's not good because you're paying them. If you have too few people sitting around, then you don't have people to to sell a project in. Right. And then everybody has different skill sets, and everyone's different geographies, ah, and so everyone has different things. That? Yeah. And so, like, basically, build a model to figure out how to efficiently staff projects. Right. How many people should we have on the bench at a given time? What what skills? What uh, geographies? What groups? And all that. Wow. And um and so I very quickly went from. I thought I knew a lot about data work too. Well, now I know a lot about data work because you get thrown in the deep end and I had to build this model from scratch. I had never done this level of work. And what happened was that first that first year at IBM, I'm like knee deep in Excel work and data work. And you know, by the way, if you're a startup guy and you go to IBM, the first thing you do is you start working on shit on the side, right? Mm. And so I needed a side hustle. I'm doing all this data work. And so I was like, man, I wonder if I get a hold of some sneaker data just to play with my own amusement. I was doing all of it at Ah. IBM work. I've collected sneakers all my life. I needed some sort of side hustle while I was there. And so I was like, man, I wonder if I get all of some sneaker data just to see what I could do with it. Mm. We figured out how to collect eBay data. We figured out how to clean it. And that was the price guide. So Mm. none of this doesn't happen unless I go to IBM and pick up a little bit of data skills. And that turns into the side project that becomes a sneaker price guide that then becomes stock So you did the fix 40 for IBM. But then you did mm-hmm. the solid 20, the hard 20 on the side hustle. So you're putting in the solid 60. That was my, more like 50, 40, but yeah. 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 Well, yeah. we caught, this is what, uh. I was just rap, I was contextualizing yeah, yeah. for the social media, the Twitter. I don't know if you're on it. Yeah, sure. I was contextualizing, because it's a very polarizing topic of how many hours you should work per mm-hmm. week. I believe you should work the number of hours you want to work per week, not what. I tell you, or Alexis O'Hannon tells you, or whoever tells you the number of hours you should work. Sure. But a fixed 40 is fine if that's what you're going for. But I like a solid 60. I, I think you are. Some all- people do a focused 50. I think it's all of them. You could do an insane 80. Yeah, I mean- You've done the insane 80? I don't know if you need a, a um, you know, a, a descriptor for it, but I, I work all the time, but I love it. Like, yeah, this, but your this job is the fun is part. Yeah. Sneakers, yeah. which is your passion. So it doesn't even- Part of it is that. What do you but, do when you go home? You you surf the web for sneakers. <laughs> um, you know, it's like so. Now I I have, I have two kids. So my daughter's seven, my son's four, and um and that's been you know it's, yeah, so you it's either shifted. yeah yeah. It, but other than that, you know, it's it's nonstop. But this, you can put forty blast. hours, fifty hours a week in and have kids. It's possible. Yeah. 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 Here's here's the decision. Look at this. If you love your work, you want to do six days a week, ten blah 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 blah. Thirteen percent of my followers do a fixed forty. 26 do the firm 50, solid 60 coming in at 34%. And I, I don't know who these insane 80 hour people are. I guess that's Nick. Um, Charles and I are at the firm 50. Your firm 50, Charles? Feels like a firm 50. 
Yeah. I think that's fine. You pick what you want to do. Respect. Um, so how did you get, I, I, this is the cliffhanger that mm-hmm. never gets answered no. here, but you walked into Google Ventures and these other places. I'm sure my friend Jonathan Treese may have helped you out a little bit, getting some meetings. He's pretty legit on the investing front. He's, Love he, those he, ventures. He, he, uh, Jonathan's been helping us since day zero, since before day zero. He's so legit. Yeah, yeah, he's great. I love that guy. Um, you know, what was interesting is, you know, you start a company with Dan and you never think that you will ever take venture funding or, or you never, you, like, it's just, it's far away. You got to get through so many other hurdles in the beginning. For sure. Um, and you get to a certain point, and, and I don't have to explain this to you or, or your your um, your listeners, is you're like, well, Dan could put in more money or, right? We can go out and, and bring other people, you know, around the table. We were fortunate to have enough success quick enough that we had a lot of inbound interest. Nice. And so we started taking meetings really for the, you know, I guess, I guess the network in the beginning because we didn't even know if if Dan was going to be interested in having outside people come involved. Mm. And um, and honestly, it was um, kind of the inverse of what you're saying. Most of the people uh, really didn't understand the space, didn't understand it, but there were two people that really did. Ah. Uh, and the two of them were uh, were David Crane. At Google Ventures. Oh, I know David. Right, David. I see at all the Warriors games. David yep. has seats at the Warriors games. And if you look at his feet, he's probably he's wearing some it. Yeezys or or some Jordans. Okay. Uh, David got it. And then Roger Lee at Battery um, had been exposed to this through his son, and uh, and you get that a lot as well. And had been just sort of really involved in. And his son, by the way, not only just uh, buying and selling, or not only buying but but selling. Oh, so he and, was running a business on yeah. the side, and like, hey, Dad, can I? Be- borrow your that's checking right. account because I need to cash some checks. That's right. And then at Google, you know, David at the time, David is now on our board at the time was uh, was not. You had and, David Crane on your board? Yeah. Well, so what Legit. happened was as Joe Krause was, uh, w- was originally on the board. Yep. And Joe also was buying and selling with his son. And so both Joe and David got the business and part of it, and Joe was on the board. And when Joe left to be, go to Lime, David yep. is now on the board. Um, but like, but those guys got it. And like, you know, Partly from their kids, but partly from from helping their kids run businesses and understood it. But even then, at the time, I don't think they fully understood the the big idea. Mm. They saw the sneaker business, and the sneaker business is really big. Like, there's no question about that, mm. right? But this idea that we, the evolution of what happens here is today we're a better secondary market. We're an evolution of eBay. But the really interesting thing becomes when you become an alternate retail channel, when you start to release products directly onto the market oh, 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 to literally oh, oh. IPO products Direct into listing. existence. Oh my yeah. God, I just figured out your business. Yeah, that's the that's the real business, oh. right? So hold up, wait a second. I'm Kanye, mm-hmm. and I guess he's partnered with Nike on those Yeezys? Adidas. 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 Yep. And they say, you know what? We could do an initial product offering, exactly. here. not an initial public offering, That's but right. an initial product offering. Exactly. We got these new Yeezys. We're not going to set the price. Exactly. We're putting the price out there. Boom. Blind Dutch auction. Blind Dutch auction. You Explain let the, what that let the market set the price. So I don't know if you uh, if we can bring it up on the screen, right? But if you if you have cl- you done a Dutch auction? Yeah. So oh. if you click, uh, if you search Ben Baller did the chain stock X, Ben Baller stock X. So we wait, did. Wait, this is not Big Baller brand, is it? No, 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 no. That's a much different thing. So uh, click on on the uh, blog. Just Google search wait, ben, wait. ben Baller. There it is. Um, ben Baller. Are these called slides? Yeah, these are slides. So See, look at that. Now I'm getting. Thank you. For, uh, but yeah, if we go to Google and and find the the blog post on up. this, I know about slides. So we created these slides. So Ben Baller is a celebrity jeweler, by the way. Yeah. Right. Right. You know who he is? Because he do. he's around in 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 this part of the world. Um. So we made these slides with Ben. It literally says on it. Ben, it says, uh, Ben Barr did the chain, which was a rap lyric, and but we put eight hundred pairs of these into the world, red and black, and uh, and it was a blind Dutch auction by size and color. And so if you scroll down, this thing literally is going to start looking like a math textbook. Blind, but by color and size. This is all the the math that oh came off of this. Oh my lord! Look at this. Hold up. Yeah. Let's get the red slides. Yeah. Wait, wait. You got more on the black. Yeah, there the black there were more quanti- there were more quantity of of, okay. of black than there were. So here we go. All winning bids sorted by largest or smallest amount. So people will put in a bid of how much. So so we first so we tell them how many pairs are available. So let's say that there were black size eight, there were sixty five pairs available, right? Right hand side. Right. And so the top sixty five bids win. And you see somebody bid a million dollars. Right. Well, that was a joke, right? Well, yes, but no. But they understood that it goes down to the clearing price, right? So in black size oh, eight, I see. So it, whatever it, the, the clearing price is, right? The sixty fifth highest bid in this case was one seventy five. So this person just doesn't want to get left out. Exactly, and they get it now. If sixty six people bid a million dollars, then there's then we a, problem. Got a problem. Yeah, but that didn't happen. Thank and the so, Lord. so that could have been problematic collecting. Yeah, yeah. 
so this one, right, because it was the first big one we did, the first true blind Dutch auction, we put all the math and, and everything so everyone can see how it played out. But you can see what happened is you have all these bids, right? The 65th highest was 175. And so those are the one, th- those are the people That's that the won. That's clearing price. Yeah. And then everybody pays 175. Which, by the way, this is what Google did with their IPO. Exactly. They said, put in what you want. And people put in high prices. Other people didn't. And then it cleared. And yep. this is how the stock market should work. Yeah. This is, this is how it should work. This is how you properly price an We asset. didn't make this up. We didn't make this up. We're literally copying- You're the first yeah. person to do this in for sneaker consumer, And for, for any consumer goods. How many sneakers have you done this with? So this is, this is the only one at this scale, but there's okay. literally two big ones. Okay. One with a big sneaker brand. Okay. Right? And uh, and one with uh, with another brand in another category coming okay. soon. But that's it a, could so, be fashion mm-hmm, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or would it be? Uh, is there baseball hats got yeah, this yeah, yeah. situation or no? Is this thing live? Are we live? We're kind of semi live, but whatever. It's only like ten people right. watching. Don't worry about it. She's a, yeah. That's why. Wait, wait. PR so it could here. be. Yeah. What are the other yeah. categories that you could go into? Have you gone into any categories? Yet? Yeah. Uh, you do so, some fashion. So yeah? so yeah. So we're in, we're in, uh, we're in four different categories today: sneakers, streetwear, which is clothing, watches, and handbags. Right. Watches and handbags. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you do a watch collab. And you got the LeBron plus whoever watch. Well, it allows you to start creating products with people to to put it into the market because I need to get in yeah. on this. So I do uh, J. Cal Crockett Jones uh, limited edition crossover. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, I need Crockett. Somebody get me Crockett Jones on the phone. There's a guy over there who's 87 years old right now, and he's mm-hmm. literally when you order Crockett and Jones, do you know how you order them? I I, I have no idea. Email. <laughs> Literally, uh, at least it's not you're telling me it's like fax. You email them yeah. your credit card number. Uh-huh. They don't have a checkout box, or they didn't. You know, okay. if you told me it was fax, that's a much better story. It is. Yeah. It is. They, they do take some fax. <laughs> I, actually, they literally do it by fax uh, as well. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, what's up with watches? Yeah. So for us, watches is is a. I mean, sneakers and streetwear are so big. Um, watches mm-hmm. and, and handbags are, are decent size, but they're just nowhere as big nowhere as sneakers and streetwear right now. Uh, yeah. So are you going out now? And do you have aspirations to maybe put together a collab so you could have the stock X? Bag that's the Fendi plus yeah all, Cardi, all of whatever. those things all of those things happen um, you know look the core business there's just there's massive growth in just the core business of of selling more products and you know right now Europe and China are really the highest priorities you know to be able to s- sell sneakers there what um, do you have to do to sell into China you got to get a partner there well you know we're we're a website so anyone can who can access it can buy or sell got but. It. Local payment methods, local language, local authentication. So, you know, we physically authenticate all the products that are sold on StockX. How? So, we have five authentication centers today. So, Uh after the sale happens, seller ships it to us. We authenticate, make sure it's real, make sure it's the right size, right condition. It is what it's supposed to be. You ever have somebody try to pass it and you catch them? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, every day. Really? Every day. So, somebody puts up some Yeezys that are counterfeit how close are they to the real thing would you say some of them are, are so great i couldn't tell the difference i don't work day to day as a Whoa. sneaker authenticator but they're really good but this is this is our this is our job right there's today there's about I 900 thought you had a master's in sneaker authentication uh, no, no, i'm, I'm not an authenticator. A master sneaker authenticator it, it didn't exist before this but we literally created that career path like we have, we, I really? think there's probably over 100 sneaker authenticators that work at StockX right now. There's about 900 people that work at StockX. About half of that is our authentication stage centers. So it so is possible it's, to not see what's interesting about this point. This might be one of the most interesting parts of the conversation. A lot of these, you know, folks are like, you know what? We are just a platform. We take no responsibility. Come platform, you know, eBay, whatever. You actually said, you know what? We're going to take responsibility that IP is not being stolen. Yep. So and eBay doesn't do that, do they? No, not at all. There, there's no. two really big parts of this. One, if you're a 14 year old kid and you've saved up a thousand dollars to buy a pair of Yeezys, you know you're gonna, never going to get a fake pair of shoes. And there's massive value in the authentication, mm. and a lot of places don't do it. But here's the thing for us, that's literally just the ante to play. Mm. That facilitates a larger model, right? Think about if, if you were buying a share of Nike stock in the New York Stock Exchange and you thought you might get a fake share of stock. It would change your perception of value. It would change just your whole interaction with mm. that market. And so for us, that just helps facilitate the larger model. Mm. So it, it absolutely, there's value in authentication because most people don't do it, but it really is about the, is the larger model. And so who's selling? What I want to know is who are the, how do people become sellers on the platform when we get back on This Week in Startup? 
the average adult has over 130 online accounts. That's 130 passwords. And no person in the world can memorize that many passwords. So they do the worst thing you can imagine. They use the same one over and over again. And then guess what? Those hackers find your email, they find your password, and they try it on your bank account. They try it on your Gmail, and then they compromise you. Well, there's a solution, and that's Dashlane. And I want you to go to dashlane.com slash twist right now and try the product. I use it, I love it, everybody here loves it. What does it do? It's a super powerful password manager, and it safely stores and autofills all your passwords your logins, your payment information, and more, but it does it across all of your devices. And it will auto-generate super complex passwords for you so that hackers, when they see that password, know, you know what? It's not even worth trying. You need to be careful, folks. You need to use Dashlane. And they are gonna tell you in real time if you've been compromised because they're monitoring all the hacking sites and they will tell you if there's been a data breach and if one of your email addresses or your name has been included in it. It also has a built-in VPN, so you don't have to go buy that from a second party. You can browse safely. So they're just thinking 360 here, and here's my CMO press signing up for Dashlane. It's super easy. He installs the browser plugin within seconds, and now he adds his passwords for social accounts, so he doesn't have to remember them again. He adds his personal information, keeps his passport there, bank wire, all of that locked, safe, and secure. And if you're offline, it still works 100% of the time. So stop guessing passwords. and. Start keeping your digital identity secure and head to dashlane.com slash twist and get 10% off a premium subscription. That's dashlane.com slash twist to get 10% off a premium subscription. Thank you so much to Dashlane for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups. All right, everybody, welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest, Josh Luber. He is Josh Luber on the Twitter, L-U-B-E-R. Uh, you know him from his days at IBM doing management yeah. consulting, yeah. Uh, but uh, I'd like to introduce you to his new company, StockX, uh, which has been doing since 2015, side hustle turned unicorn. Congratulations on that. That's a little mind blowing for you. you. Yeah. It's, That's a little heady. It, it is, but you know, it, it's just, it's one day at a time and you know, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy mm -hmm. to think that you in four years built something that's worth a billion dollars. Yeah. But like the crazier part is that like it still feels like it's day zero. It does. Like everyone's still doing seven jobs. It feels like everything's still in front of us. Yeah. Um, and that like that's what's really exciting about it. Like it literally is it it's the same feeling we had when there were five of us sitting outside of Dan's office. Like, mm -hmm. you know, What's so. it like when that hundred ten million dollar wire comes in? Because you see the bank statement, somebody comes into the office is like, uh, dude, there's a hundred ten million dollars in the bank account, it's real. Yeah. What's it like to look at that number? You know, um, I wish I could say that it was like a, a big deal. Um, it's got to be you know? weird though, right? You got to feel some weird like, whoa. Yeah, you're sort of so far in it. It's like one of those things. So about a year ago, I, I started a project internally to document everything. And I put mm. together a team, uh, like two people from the content team, one archivist and one video guy to document everything because it's this. Because in the moment, I didn't think anything of it. You know, Greg and I, who's the co-founder yeah. and uh, and COO, and he and I had been running the company day to day. We were just like, all right, money's there, like good, like write checks. Like, you know, you're just so far in it. Right. But like we started a project to, to document Everything. So it's going to be a documentary yeah, yeah, yeah. film Sundance. I don't know. If, we're not. We're not, we haven't been. Sounds filming. like a reality show, my friend. Let me be clear. We haven't been following people with cameras. At least I hope not. Because uh, I don't know. Maybe, mm. maybe there's a fourth yeah. camera in the room. So this I don't know. Sounds if we're like filming the this. most legit. What no. you're doing would be the oh. greatest. I know. E entertainment. I kind of wish we had actually been filming stuff. Well, but at least like to, be to doing capture now, everything. Game is yeah. so hot. If you had a. You should literally be doing a reality show. We get celebrities. Fascinating. We get celebrities come by the office all the time. We actually have like. It, I mean, it's a fun place to come visit. Mm. One, the authentication center in Detroit, which is down the street, and then the, the office Amen. itself. So, What's good food in Detroit? Is good food there? Well, they'll tell you Detroit's thing is, is Coney's, is hot dogs. I don't really like hot dogs, so that's what? not my thing. Yeah, Coney's? Yeah. That's like their thing. I was like, when they when I came to visit and they were like like wooing me, they took me to like a hot dog. But I'm like, really? I was like, really? you're in Philly. I'm from Philly. You come to Philly, I'll take you to a good cheesesteak spot. Yeah, yeah, Detroit's got to up the food game. Sorry, Eminem, Marshall, Mr. Mathers. Nobody's rocking a hot dog. I think it's not working. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, how do I become a seller on the platform? Uh, you just click sell. That's it? Yeah. So anybody can sell. Yeah. List your product for sale or sell immediately at the highest bid. Ship your item within two business days. You authenticate it. Uh, then they release the funds to you and you get to sip your daiquiri knowing you'll never get a charge back. Boom. You know, the, the, 
everything about the stock market pretty, model. You made it pretty, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you yeah. made it really fluid here because you got the whole database yeah. from your days doing the blue book. Yeah. But like if you choose any shoe, like go to any of the shoes, the the, the whole thing, right, if you just bring up is is being able to sell at, at the highest bid, right? So if you click sell now, like there's a bid at 270 for this. This is tied to someone's PayPal or their credit card. Oh, so when you right? do next, bang, it's sold. Yeah. Now, obviously, if you haven't already set up your account, you'll have to set up an account from here. But once yeah. you set up an account, like to sell something, you never have to list anything mm -hmm. for sale ever, right? Think about if you had to share, uh, sell Nike stock that way. You don't you don't list your your share of Nike stock and hope someone comes and buys it. No. Now you go to the market. Nike's trading at eighty bucks, and you can yeah, sell it. Right? It's a market order, right? Yeah, that's what that, they call that, it in the stock market. Yeah, market the, order. Of all this stuff here, like that bid on StockX, like that is true consumer demand. Like that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. That is core to this whole thing. Interesting. Are you going to be able to do on demand? So let's say you email your list, and you're like, "Hey." almost like Kickstarter, but more like we want this Jordan to be re-released. We're willing to put up a Dutch auction and we'll put up the 500,000. And you say to Nike, hey, we got 500,000 in demand for this. Will you do it? Yeah, that that is a natural evolution. That would be so of the model. amazing. The only thing, it, it, it probably works better for some of the other categories Production cycles for sneakers take, you know, a minimum six months, a lot of times closer to 12 to 18 months. Mm. So, but you could think about doing it for products that are, are t-shirts, mm. right? Or, you know, things that you, yeah, that you can- Yeah, Teespring did that, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you could- Right. Like so a th there's a lot of these these products that, that go down this, but it, it's, it's all about like, and then everything that comes off of that, right? Mm. Fractional shares and indices and-, mm. and Yeah, you, know, you saw this Rally trading. Road. Have you seen that yeah, company, sure. Rally Road? Yeah, yeah, I had I them on the guys. pod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was pretty, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Like- Buy a share. I'm thinking of putting my. I have some old school Teslas, and I'm thinking about putting the two of them on there, and then selling half my interest in them, right. to let other people have a ride on the upside, a ride on the upside. All right. That's actually a pretty good tagline for Rally Road. You're welcome. A ride on the upside. <laughs> yeah. But I'd like to give them a ride on the <laughs> upside. Could somebody just get ride on the upside.com for me right now? Yeah. T tell that's press right good. now. Ride on the upside. That's gonna. Yeah. Dot yeah. com. Please. Uh -huh. It's got it. Somebody's got to have that taken. Yeah. I think probably. Our Patreon. The ride listeners. on the upside also might be a triple yeah, X. How do you like my yeah. get the seat dot com mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. my uh, job applicants? Get the seat. Get the seat. Yeah. It's just presuming that you want it. That's right. And that you got to fight for it. Mm -hmm. Right? As opposed to filling a seat. How about you get the seat? Yeah, yeah. Take the seat. <laughs> I like it. A little bit better. Um, all right. It's incredible what you've done. It's only the beginning, man. Like, once. 18 months from now, 24 months, when every Monday morning there's just 20 products IPOing. The secondary market continues to 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 yeah. go, but it just here's the products that are IPOing, and it just and that pro that, that product then just rolls right into mm -hmm. the secondary market, right? Product right. releases, and then it just continues to trade. So great. You could do this for tickets to concerts too. That would be kind of dope. Well, you know, a lot of the times we actually point to StubHub as a really great example of, you know, StubHub brought primary and, and secondary markets together. Did they right, get the primary right. market? Is that how well, it works? It not, not in all cases, but like, you know, the Sixers, the Yankees, a few other teams, they have primary ticket deals with some of these organizations. Ah. And so it's blurred the line. Like, think about it. You buy tickets on StubHub. It could come from a team, a league, a guy down the street, a broker. Yes. And like, and you don't Season care. ticket holders yeah. are reselling. You just you don't care. I just want to see it. Yeah, and that and that same thing in the stock market, right? You buy a share of Nike stock. There's an actual seller on the other end of that trade selling you that mm -hmm. share, and you don't care who that is. You just you, care what you, you pay for. You tap the StubHub president to go work with you, right? Yeah, and and so by the way, uh, you know, M. Mark, Scooter Braun, you know, Ted Leonsis, Tim Armstrong, all these guys that invest oh, in the first round. Ted bought my company. All those guys in the first round, probably the most important was Scott. And so Scott Cutler, who at the time was the CEO of StubHub, was an investor in that first round because before StubHub, he was at the New York Stock Exchange. There was huh. probably no one that understood our model better than Scott on day one yeah. that we launched. And so he became one of our closest advisors over the past couple of years, Greg and I, as we were running the company. And we already thought, you know, if we ever got big enough, man, he would be the perfect person to help mm -hmm. us. And then we got big enough, and then he left eBay, and, and so it's it worked amazing. out perfectly. And so See, it's been about two months. See, this is what capitalism is about. If you the market corrects and is efficient, and what we're seeing is whether it's Uber or Airbnb or StockX, the proper or Bill Gurley with the IPO, you know, uh, Dutch auction and him mm -hmm. trying to make IPOs, direct listings more efficient. 
when you make markets more efficient, consumers win. Yeah. When the government, when monopolies get control over things and there's not a proper market, consumers lose. Yep. And now you can t you can cherry pick examples of some sneaker going for a lot of money, but you can also cherry pick some kid who's good at this, predicting what the next ones are and making a business out of it yeah. and buying low and selling high, yeah. which is what you want is you want that monetary velocity. You want a market to make prices for things. Yeah. And that's what we did. Uh, you know, there was no transparency in this market before StockX. Mm. There was no transparency. Everybody thought they, you know, like, Buy these Yeezys. I'm the only one that has it. They're a thousand dollars. Well, there were nine other people that had a pair of Yeezys yeah, you over there. Know. There was just no transparency around it. And you put so. that little. Am I? I have the Yeezys I bought. It's got your little green mm -hmm. thing on the side. Am I supposed to take that off, or is it fly to walk around with it? What's the intent so, there? Some people absolutely walk around with it. When I we walked around with it yesterday, it, and yeah. I kind of like it. No, we. That was not the intent. We created it, but people started doing it, and frankly, that's awesome. It's like awesome it's good. It's yeah. great. It's great for us, you know, and and. And, and by the way, where we see it a lot of times is like we get pictures all the time from China. People are like, hey, I saw this guy. Because there's that much uh, more need to prove that your shoes are authentic and value in the authentication. Right. And so we start to see that. Your, uh, has anybody knocked tag? off your uh, tag? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can search eBay and absolutely find fake StockX tags all over. Yeah, That's hilarious. Mm -hmm. You need to make a StockX tag with a uh, QR code on it. So I can QR code it. Yeah, yeah. So there, prove it. There is a QR code on it. We're not. We don't. You can't hit it right now. We can hit it right uh -huh. when, when it comes back to us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually there'll be more technology in that chip. Great. But you know, for now, it, you know, I remember the first time that somebody you know knocked it off and we saw it on eBay. You know, my immediate reaction was like, you know, I was pissed off for about thirty seconds, and I was like, oh, well, that's pretty. It's cool. really cool because I have my now you know StockX receipt when I bought my Yeezys. Uh -huh. And uh, you did confirm these are 100% new and they were authentic. Yep. And I paid $320 for sneakers. Well, you know, you got to start somewhere. We'll get you up to 900 and 1,000. I kind of feel like I'm in the game now, I'll be honest. <laughs> Because I've wear, been you, rocking the Crockett and Jones. People but, are going to notice your Yeezys. I guarantee you wear them on the floor. I really of the... liked them, but I'm going to be sitting courtside four times this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, and I'm going to need sneakers for those four times. And I, you ha I'm going to need some cons consultation here, Josh. Right. I want, I need, I need something in the fifteen hundred dollar range because okay. I don't want to seem like I'm like. No offense to you, Josh. I, I don't want it to seem like I'm going six hundred, nine hundred, yeah, which I know is your sweet spot. Yeah. I want people to think <laughs> that I'm just overdoing it a bit, but not the five thousand. Yeah. You know, is that am I? Yeah, Doing yeah, it yeah. right? I'll tell you what. You know what's a perfect shoe is- Where's my kill zone? Yeah, yeah. 900 to 1200? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think the kill zone I think is that's for good. not trying too hard? Go to go to the Jordan 1 Off-White White. Jordan 1 Off-White. Do you like white sneakers? No, no. So one up one up from that? One that Because that's just the, that's the girl's version? Or the, the girl's girl size? GS. It stands for GS. Oh, girl's. Yeah. Girl. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, all right. So this- All right. All right. Never mind. The price has jumped a lot on these. Uh, Those but great. People these are that, right? they will notice it, but it's also and subtle enough because it's because it's all white. It's a little it's subtle enough, but the people that would know will know. You know, I gotta know about the um, Knicks. What's going on mm -hmm. with my Patrick Ewings? Can I get a Patrick Ewings search in here? <laughs> you don't want to wear a pair of Ewings. The, no, Ewings you can get at at, at uh, probably twenty five percent of of retail. Um, really? Yeah. yeah, this yeah, is gonna be real if it even exists. They don't even exist. My yeah. God. I got I got I mean, that is a big, huge, ugly, chunky shoe for you to walk around. I, I mean, know. That is just, That's my yeah, guy. Yeah. That's my guy, Patrick. Uh, okay, well, I guess they really don't even have Reebok Pump Omnilite. What is that? That was the deep brown shoe, right? You remember when he closed his eyes and, and pumped it up and then, you know, it went like this and dunked it? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. That was a deep brown shoe. That's, I mean, they re released so you could it. So mm -hmm. you could go ironic. And ironic does start a conversation. Where am I in the? What's on the ironic hipster? I guess I, if I go full Kawhi purple, that's as ironic as it gets, right? Yeah, I mean that's it's just the championship so pack. I mean that yeah. is so whack. I mean I don't mean to date myself, no, it's but that bad. is whack. Yeah, 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 you're right. Like that nine nineties. By the way, nine nineties I think are the the or the brand that. Steve Jobs wore, rest in peace. Shout out Steve Jobs. Did he, it was a, 990 was the model. I thought 990s or something. It might be. 990s are pretty, uh, they obviously, they, they So they basically it. took the Steve yeah, Jobs yeah. nerd buy, the uh -huh. 90, because he used to buy them for 90 bucks or 95 bucks, and he'd buy 10 at a time, they yeah. said. And he'd just rotate them, and he'd wear with his jeans and his turtleneck. And then Kawhi comes in, and he 
makes them purple and red, the two worst colors you could ever yeah. imagine combining. Oh, well, that's what, it's the Raptors. I know, How about, which is like the first, and as I told, uh, who's the kid on the Raptors who I was trolling? Kyle Lowry. Yeah, I told Kyle Lowry, enjoy this championship because you're never coming back. Well, no. no Why is not coming back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not coming back. If well, you, if by chance, if you beat the, if you happen to beat the Warriors, that was a crazy run. I mean, they got crazy. so lucky with. I mean, not so, the, not not that you wish for injuries, right? But they got no, so lucky if, with the injuries for if if Durant and Clay go down right now. No. E, uh, if yeah, if we if we just have. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Go to how about how about uh, Jordan one off white Carolina? You want to like really make a statement? The bl- yeah the the here go back up top it'll come up there you go the blue one same shoe different color sixteen in, in your okay. in your I price can, range in my price range nine and a half nineteen twenty I can do that if, if you think you can rock these this is everybody will notice this one really for, oh for sure it's got the sky blue yeah yeah, yeah. with the orange yeah. which is my favorite color yeah. uh, so this is without all this extra stuff this was like one of the original Jordan colorways right Carolina blue. Jordan one, but you know Virgil, all the off white stuff on there made it a sixteen hundred dollars shoe. What's the when you put that air on there and you put that text on the other side? That's something you add to it. Mm. All that design is is done by by the designer by Virgil Abloh. So yeah, he yeah. puts air in quotes. Yeah, yeah. So it's air mm. quotes. Yeah, that's what. Get it? That, yeah. But he literally puts on the mo- he, they put the mm. model on the sneaker there. Turn around. Yeah, I mean this is just happens to be the design of the shoe, right? That Nike let him took some liberties and and have some fun with it and and create a really you know. I like how they unique. put the description of it on the shoe. Mm-hmm. That is inspired. I have to tell you, you wear this courtside. Am I gonna get? You're you're pounds? you're gonna you're not gonna be able to watch the game. Everyone's just gonna be keep coming up to you talking about the game, your shoes. Really? Oh yeah. You're kidding me. Mm-hmm. Well, this is my kind of. Just make sure you're wearing the StockX tag while you're doing it. Uh, keep the no, keep the tag on it. Listen, yep. if you're going halfsies mm-hmm. with me on these, that's for sure. I mean, you're the one buying the we're, tickets we're just, now. Like I, we started with, we're just the marketplace. We don't sell anything. I don't. I don't own any shoes. Right. Listen, mm-hmm. continued success, success, Josh. Uh, this really proves that following your vision and your passion can result in you building a unicorn. If you have a data science background and work for IBM, it's a key part of the story. <laughs> yeah, it's a, just an, it's a footnote. It's a footnote. I can just picture you like. Did did you ever wear <laughs> like sneakers? Uh, Were you allowed to wear them in the building? Uh, you know, I'm gonna rethink my game here mm-hmm. because I was getting a little upset about people wearing like ratty shoes to the office. Mm-hmm. If your shoes cost 400 or more <laughs> on StockX, you can wear sneakers to Bring the office. Bring in your StockX. But you have to have it authenticated. Receipt. Okay. Yeah. All right. Listen. Continued success. Thank and you so much. Everybody, go to StockX right now and buy a pair. Uh, you won't regret it. It's a great experience. Uh, congratulations. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups.